So we do have a couple more people coming in. Grab a chair wherever you can find them. I think we have three more back here. This is an amazing turnout. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here today. I'm Rebecca Cummings. I'm the Interim Director of Digital Matters. I am so excited to introduce our guest for today, who obviously has a fan following at the university. So this will be great. So our speaker today is Craig Dworkin. Craig is a poet, critic, editor, and professor of English here at the University of Utah. And his topic for today is Thatcher of the Archive. He is also the founding senior editor of the Eclipse Archive, a free online archive of radical small press writing from the last quarter century, which we're going to hear about today. Craig has been doing digital scholarship at the U long before it was cool and before places like Digital Matters even existed. And we are delighted to welcome him to our speaker series today. So join me in welcoming Craig Dworkin. Thank you, Rebecca and Comstock and Jack and everyone here who made this work. Um, I'm immensely, uh, immensely honored um, to be invited to talk about Eclipse. Um, trying to learn how to go to slash. Um, it's a website that I built to provide digital facsimiles of out of print, small press, experimental literature. Um, let's give you a sense of what the archive does. So works are presented with um, really bare bones, colophons, physical description, publication history, and then uh, high resolution, single page or um, openings, and then lower file size, reading copies that are either OCR or um, retyped by myself, or more recently with, um, with smaller file size images. I don't know how to get that. I'm proving that I'm a Luddite. <laughs> no, this is actually, this is our brand new data visualization screen, never before tested. So, Greg, if you might need your help with me right now. I think I got it. Broke the digital matters. Lab. We did not. Oh, I <laughs> <laughs> I actually know what to do here. Okay. Sorry. No, that's okay. We're testing. I think I actually built. Okay. Okay. We built digital matters. Here. Let me try here. Try here. Okay. Oh, there's a here. And then to get that to great. Thank you. Um so that is really pretty much um eclipse. Uh website spelled from hand. Um hand type, plain text, notepad, HTML. Um, it currently has about 300 titles, tens of thousands of pages, but only about 15 gigabytes um, of space. That's half the storage on your smallest iPhone. Um, and it gets about 150 unique visitors a day. It's a little hard to figure out who is actually human and, and what's a bot um, and, um, who gets there erroneously. We get big spikes around celestial events as people look for <laughs> homes about the eclipse um, or scores and scores of people um, who make Kenneth Goldsmith's traffic uh, the most visited site. Traffic gets the most traffic um, by orders of magnitude. It's, um, I'm gonna mess this up again and have trouble coming back to the slideshow, but. But we're here to help. Oh, but you don't see that, do you? Um, doesn't matter. Traffic um, is ostensibly a transcript of uh, 24 hours of AM radio traffic reports from 1010 winds, all the news, all the time, traffic and weather together on the ones. So all of these poor commuters in the New York metropolitan area, hapless drivers, 
trying to decide, um, do I take the Lincoln Tunnel? Do I take the George Washington Bridge? My exit's coming up, I have just a moment. They're looking for real-time dynamic Google data to help them make their decision and they end up looking at this 20 year old uh, traffic. Report, I'm sorry, I can't get back to the PowerPoint. Um, so I think how to do that. Um, they're stuck in traffic. Ezra Pound said that, that poetry is news that stays news. Um, and if we take stay there, not as remains news, but as like a stay of execution, delaying or bringing to a standstill, uh, like bumper to bumper traffic, then this is in fact news that stays news. But can I ask you one more time? Yeah. So, so let's pause and get it right. Once I'm in, once I'm on the web browser, how do I return to the PowerPoint? I'll go up there. Okay. I just to see Hey, Greg, do you mind coming up for a sec? Talk amongst yourselves for a second. It's too awkward when you're all quiet. <laughs> No, I just want to be able to get back to the PowerPoint myself. <laughs> Is that not going to work for you? Do you do this toggle between PowerPoint and, and the web? So it's like, oh, it's not displaying it as the front of So when I try to go to PowerPoint, it doesn't work. So it's, it's showing there, but I don't know how to. Maybe I can just click. Oh, and you can just click. And then the hardware Okay. I'll, let me work with this and see what I can do. I'm not going to I think I can just read, I'll just read from here. I don't need to see the PowerPoint because I didn't see it up here. And I'll see if I, maybe I'll skip going on to the web. Um, okay, for a while I blocked Google from indexing those, um, uh, from indexing those files. Um, but I actually kind of like the poetic anarchy of, um, uh, of that, um, and st I stopped feeling sorry for the commuters and realized that Google had transformed this, you know, old work of conceptual literature into a stealth public service announcement that just says, "Don't use your cell phone while you're driving." <laughs> um, anyway, okay, about um, 150 intentional users a day, and I know why they are coming to Eclipse. They want to access books that they can't otherwise get to, um, but I. Could not figure out why Rebecca invited me to talk about Eclipse to you all. Um, I think it was Digital Matters as the place with the highest tech, um, the newest tools, um, the newest books, the newest films, like they talked about last week, um, cutting edge 21st century digital humanities work, um, the very opposite of a 20th century website, a website with no coding even, with no, no programming languages in the front of this, um, just HTML cascading style sheets and anchors pointing to JPEGs um, and PDFs. That's why we have an image of an old fashioned. So um, I thought I would actually focus on this discrepancy and um, think about what it means to have this antiquated publishing site uh, that's still persisting in a world where the technology has evolved um, and also where the literary has involved. Poetry means something very different than it meant at the end of the 20th century. Um, publishing has obviously changed radically um, since then. So I've shown you essentially what Eclipse does. 
you can just select PowerPoint, like click on PowerPoint on the monitor, and then once it's like selected, then that, yeah, so now it should. Thank you. Okay, showed you what Eclipse does. <laughs> I'm gonna need your help again. I'm right here. Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about actually what the site does not do, um, about the aspects of the site and the history of the site that are not evident from a current user's point of view. And it's called Eclipse um, for a reason I can talk about, but it seemed appropriate to talk about what is Eclipse or occluded um, in this project. But before I talk about what is not seen, I just want to bask for a moment in the fact that it is visible at all. Um, this was launched in 1998, um, which was like the, um, the Devonian age of the prehistoric internet, or as the age of the um, second, second great wave of mass extinctions. And I could have known this at the time, but it's actually uh, it's a really pivotal year in the history of the web. It's the moment that the web moves away from GeoCities and Tripod and Angel Fire. Um, these are the predominant sites in 1996 and 1997. Um, they're they basically they're, they're offering you know homesteading 40 acres or home page steading 40 acres for people who are willing to put in a little bit of work to make a website, but because of the platforms didn't need to master FTP protocols or um, or Linux or have to have to compile anything. And I'm gonna well, I was gonna show you some. I'm going to pause this for a second. And if it doesn't work, I'm just not going to worry about it. I was going to show you what the web looked like at the time. Cool. Oh, that's good. Very. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. I'm not going to do the fancy thing I wanted to do. I was going to show you what web pages look like because they were they look different since some of you weren't even born then. Um, but there are about 200, just to give you a sense, about 200,000 web pages in 1997. 1999, um, what, 200,000 web pages, they're being viewed on Netscape Navigator. Um, they're being searched by InfoSeq and Ask Jeeves, my, still my very favorite, um, Alta Vista, Magellan. And they're accessed for most people at, you know, 28.8 or 33.6 kilobytes per second. The blisteringly fast 56K <laughs> modem comes out in 1998. Um, I put this in the context of, right, this is 2,200 times faster than the average web access today. That's the average access today compared to the theoretical maximum digital line strength um, at the time. So by 1999, those 200,000 or so web pages have grown to about 2 million web pages. Eclipse is one of them. Um, and again, put that into context, about 200 million web pages, live active web pages today. So three orders of magnitude back 
from when Eclipse was being planned. And tellingly, there are about a billion more inactive web pages today. So most of the web today is um, junk space. 85% of the web is, um, there's Netscape now, um, there's a 56K modem, and there's the web today, massive fossil bits. Um, as, you know, in part, as things like Angel Fire got replaced by Yahoo, AOL, MSN, Lycos, there's obviously another age of mass extinctions that's coming. Um, live Journal, not yet live. Friendster, new friends. Um, you know, seven full graduating classes of Harvard bros are going to have to make do without the date rate app. They would become Facebook. Not, um, I mean, to be fair, not all of the web pages launched in 1998. Uh, went extinct, you may have heard of Google, um, which came out that year and has done slightly better um, in terms of diversification and growth. Um, and Google grew fast, it partnered with Yahoo. So with just a couple of years by the end of the century, by 2000, it had gained dominance. And just as they were making it big, um, in fact, this guy um, from Google named Larry, who had this big secretive plan for scanning books called me um, and wanted advice from Eclipse about scanning, uh, wanted to know if Eclipse could be like the core of what he called um, something like the ocean of books. It was gonna be fast as the ocean. Though so all I could think at the time was how bad, and the librarians here will know, you don't wanna put books in the ocean. Water um, isn't good for it. This of course became Google Books within, within a few years. And he obviously didn't need my help but I think a good reminder that things start small. I mean, Eclipse had maybe 30 books on it at the time. It looked really big. Um, and that there was a moment in the web that was um, about mutual aid. It was about gift economies, um, you know, the, about collective endeavor. The, the project at the time, I, I honestly think, was not to lure in bibliophiles and sell their private information. It was just how cool have every book. Maybe we'll have every book. They're still in the do no evil mode, which didn't last long. 2000, though, already year, years away from Eclipse and changing fast. Uh, XML is released in 1998. Um, and it's the very moment when the phrase digital humanity starts to overtake humanity's computing. Um, though even then, that's still a phrase that's much, we're in the right building. It's much more in use in library science than in English departments. So Eclipse evolves out of this Devonian age, um, the first stable soils um, that cohere from the, the moss forests and bacterial algal mats of the Silurian age of FTP. It's launched into, don't get away from me, it launched into the Carboniferous age of um, the 21st century. And today, um, I say the sort of living fossil um, swimming largely undetected through um, the quaternary waters of um, the age of fiber optics, um, these rising, warming, plastic-filled uh, oceans of data that Google envisioned and, and created. Um, so I want to look back over, um, sorry for the delay with the PowerPoint, I'm going to go fast. I want to look back over the last quarter century um, to some of the evolutionary paths that Eclipse did not take. I want to think about why this dinosaur did not become a bird um, and look just quickly at five brief episodes, I promise they're brief, that I think are telling in terms of the kind of corporate models and the economic models that the archive refused or embraced. Um, and these moments, I think, are not um, Maybe not sufficient to explain um, its continued life, but may have been necessary for that, and maybe have, this is what I'm hoping we can talk about, um, maybe have lessons for the kind of projects um, that people are doing in the 21st century um, with digital humanity. So first episode, I've just gotten a job um, at Princeton University, and I drop a budget, and I figured that with 
$300, I can build and maintain this grand website that I have. In mind, I basically need a scanner and I need to buy out university server space. Um, this all the time when you couldn't save too many plain text emails um, even. And what I really wanted, what was really important to me was a clean domain name. I wanted something like eclipse.archive, um, or sorry, eclipse.princeton.edu rather than www.princeton.edu slash art slash faculty slash English slash Dworkin slash tilde. Eclipse, I hated these little tildes. Um, they, they pointed to they pointed to root files. They've been deprecated. Um, but it was just, since everything's a large decimal number, I couldn't figure out why we couldn't just have actually a name. Um, but this required the highest level of IT approval. Um, I make this impassioned case to my chair for the pedagogic value of this project, the research value, talk more about that. Um, chair says no, but I just happened um, to see this press release that Firestone Library um, had a new commitment to humanities computing. Their entire new wing devoted to electronic literature in which they have zero holdings. They have an entire division of electronic literature with no literature whatsoever. So I make my pitch to the head librarian and say, look, $300, I can build out your shelf of poetry in your new virtual library. She says, no. But she says, what about, what about $30,000? Um, you can make a laser disc served by subscription to Harvard and Cornell. Eventually, big state schools, just thinking of places like Utah, um, will subscribe. Revenue will roll in. You get $30,000 every year. You can hire somebody, all of which goes against the ethos of um, Eclipse, obviously. The do-it-yourself ethos. You can see in the hand-typed HTML or in the fact that before this, I'd never, I'd never built a website even on GeoCities, um, I got a O'Reilly guide and rolled on my sleeves and got to work. It also went against an ethos of this anti-commodification and anti-commercialization. I'm actually, I'm very proud that Eclipse is not a nonprofit. It is opposed to financial transactions altogether. Then we'll talk about some exceptions at the end. Um, and a founding commitment to a kind of radical inclusivity and, and open access. This is a very raison d'etre of making these works available in the first place. Um, so I went to um, HR Computer World. I bought a scanner myself, um, but I did work with one of the techs in this otherwise empty library division because um, she couldn't claim she had anything better uh, to do, which brings me to episode two. Um, in which she presents the two compression software options. Um, early years of Eclipse, all about squeezing every last bit, literally every bit of data out of an image file. Um, this is why I talked about the modem speeds, this is why I talked about server storage costs. Um, and part of what drew the technicians in the library to rebellion when I insisted that we scan every blank page, the inside covers, free front end papers, uh, which they thought was unethically wasteful and they wouldn't do it, which is why I started scanning uh, myself. So the two options are Mr. Sid from Lizard Tech, comes out in 1996, um, PDF from Adobe, which comes out in 93 or 94. Um, and she said, look, it's Adobe company, probably not going anywhere. These smart money is on lizard tech. It's much more innovative. It's, it's much more exciting. Now, I don't know if you've heard of this Adobe company, but I don't have to tell you that lizard tech, big success was being acquired by the font management company for 800 flowers. Here's the team instilling confidence. Um, so after a few years, I have to take most of the year and go back and convert all the SID files to PDF files. Um, okay, Sid leads me to episode three. There's a lot of cruft. Um, 
clinging to some of the files deep, deep in the Eclipse uh, folders, all the deprecated and non-functioning and redundant and useless tags and code and kludge all of the, um, the detritus of failed experiments and workarounds because I didn't know enough um, in dead ends, including XML. Um, I learned XHTML as soon as it was published in 2000 and rebuilt the whole site with extensible and structured data. Um, but then as I thought about it, I actually found myself really opposed at a theoretical level to metadata. Um, no! <laughs> and this has obvious implications for how uh, we work in Web2, in, in the semantic web, which, um, as we know, is structured um, and permeated at every level um, by formal representations of formal representations data about data. Um, the remnants of experiments. I, I got interested in, in PHP and, and um, just used Eclipse as my, my, my own learning ground, but eventually stripped everything back, um, scrapped everything except HTML. Um, so this is a site, site that is stateless. Um, there's no individualization, um, right? It's, it's gonna look the same to all of you on any device, no matter what you've done, no matter where you are. Um, and it also means um, since you know, there's no tracking on it, there are no, um, there are no pop-ups about cookies ruining your browsing experience to tell you about enhancing your browsing experience or stopping the functionality of the site to tell you about improving the functionality of the site. There's no exit tracking. Um, no data compliance statements, right? The design of the web today, this astonishes me just from a design perspective, um, is filled with obstacles to use, right? It form, we think the form should follow function in a certain design ethos. Form here is, is obviating function. There's no clicking to consent on things that you haven't, uh, you haven't read so that you can get to the thing that you were trying to read. Uh, in the first place, and so on. For episode four, blockage and access. Um, the original interface for Eclipse um, was the first instance ever of what was assumed ubiquitous rotating 3D word cloud, um, which is why I wanted to have the Cartesian animation at the beginning. Um, I wish I had an archive of the archive. Um, I wish I could port something and show you what this looks like. I've got a bad approximation, vague, vague sense of this. Um, I loved it. It was striking. No one had ever seen anything like it. Um, and I, it was both a little mysterious, but it was also kind of inviting. Um, it encouraged exploration, encouraged play, which I liked. It was inefficient, um, but kind of fun. Um, and it wasn't hard to figure out. Um, it was invented by uh, this MIT grad student who built it for Eclipse as, as a portfolio project. Um, it was this Russian kid. Um, and I remember buying this really nice bottle of champagne to thank him when, when the website launched. It was within half the operating budget for Eclipse, this one <laughs> bottle. Um, but he wouldn't give me his address. He was also a little mysterious um, and, and not much fun. Um, no one ever met him. He was a little shadowy. He returned to Russia that year. He's probably hacking our, our voting machines this very moment. Um, but the lesson, um, the, well, which means that since, since his code pointed back to his MIT student account, when they close that account, total black box. And this is why I don't have the rotating web cloud anymore. Um, this is part of the lesson about gift economies. Um, I didn't hire him. He didn't ask for a bottle of champagne. He wouldn't take the bottle of champagne. Um, and in part about who has the key. Um, so design plus the guy with the key last episode about a decade ago, 20, almost exactly a decade ago, about a month away, end of 
end of fall term 2012, um, the director of college computing for humanities, and a creepy guy named Lonnie Norton, commits a horrific B-movie style lurid sexual crime in his office. Um, he's, I looked at him up. He's currently inmate number 222007 in the brand new state correctional facility. Um, and he was the one guy with the key. Note the irony there. Um, after he got arrested, all the humanities websites went down, um, which I learned when I woke up one morning to scores and scores of panicked emails from students from PhD students, people who are trying to do their final papers or write their chapters or write their book chapters on primary material on the clips they no longer can actually look at what they're supposed to be writing about. University IT gets the department websites up pretty fast, but Lonnie had not, um, Lonnie had not been using best practices you know, <laughs> around information architecture. Um, and even the forensic police team like, couldn't figure out what was where or what these files were, which has a silver lining, which is that Eclipse should not have been on these servers at all, where it had been living for years, um, in part because um, it didn't meet a whole host of university IT requirements. So it's only thanks to this kind of irresponsibility um, that Eclipse was working. And most of, most of the university IT requirements would have been fairly easy to um, either correct or make exceptions for. But the one thing they were adamant about when I was trying to get this back online, um, and Amanda will remember this um, from our old job, was that every page had to be branded with the block U. Block U, the fancy name for this really ugly typeface in this red color with Please note the registered trademark. Don't anybody, don't go using this to brand your own university apparel. Um, I could have had Eclipse nested within headers and footers um, in one of the approved color palette uh, with links to legal notices and spoiler plate and intellectual property announcements. I did not collage this and make this up. This is their own promotional material. <laughs> just, I, just to say that some people do not have a geometric slab serif typeface. Um, you might have it on your desk. Um, but Eclipse has always stood out. I'm not even going to try to go to my, I, I found beautiful archive pages of poetry, you know, GeoCities poetry pages from the late 90s. Go look them up. Um, I won't show you how different it was. So this won't really work. Um, except to say that it stood out against the vernacular of the 90s by its uh, energy eclipse. Imagine those beautiful silvers and grays. It's obviously grounded in 90s design. Um, but it did not have sparkles and tiled images and multicolored um, Comic Sans, um, and in fact has the grays and silvers of Eclipse from purely numerical derivation, their hexadecimal um, color coding to hashtag 303030 and hashtag 808080. If you're dyslexic like me, I can't actually explain this. Threes and eights have a special relationship. Um, and my point is not that Eclipse gray looks somehow inherently better than Pantone 185, which is Utah red, um, or, um, you know, just that I think the Minion Web is more appropriate for a literary website than Vitesse, which is one of the approved University of Utah website uh, typefaces. But that part of the argument of Eclipse, um, with all its image files, with the scanned blank pages is that how you present information is part of the information that's being presented. And here we have the look of information, the look of research being determined by lawyers whose main job is policing the logos on sweatshirts and mugs 
um, in the campus store, which as if it's a new wing in the Princeton Library, and despite being called the bookstore sometimes, has actually no books in it. And even their textbook division is unable to order the kind of small press titles that Eclipse archives. And part of the very reason, pedagogic reason, that I built the website in the first place. So these questions of commercialization, commodification, and the worst parts of corporate culture come back even in an academic setting to make um, the web funkier and, and uglier than it needs to be, which leads me paradoxically right back to commercial corporate culture. 2012, I moved um, the site to Exmission servers. Um, I take on an associate editor for moral support, um, the incredible Danny Snelson, who now works at UCLA. Um, and the site is run from eclipsearchive.org, no tildes um, ever since then. Okay, so my point about all of this is that there's something that's really untimely about Eclipse. It's briefly ahead of its time, and then uh, it is ridiculously antiquated for most of its life. Its temporality is entirely out of joint. Um, and I'll end by just remarking briefly all, that I think the strange temporality of Eclipse brings together uh, its technical ethos, uh, its status as an archive, um, and its focus on avant-garde literature, that these all have um, homologous temporalities and analogous paradoxes. So to begin with, as I've been sort of narrating, Eclipse quite explicitly Luddite um, in the sense of those 19th century English saboteurs um, who broke gig mills and power looms and stocking frames, all the new textile knitting machines of the Industrial Revolution, um, out of which not coincidentally computers um, evolved, or even the old machines um, of the late 18th century that were newly disenfranchising and displacing and alienating workers in the British Midlands around 18, 1811. Uh, they occasionally set fire to things as well, um, but they also just smashed things. Um, I'd like to give a whole talk about the Luddites, I realized as I was putting this together, but I will just recommend um, a recent book by Gavin Mueller, um, Breaking Things at Work, this would be a good book for the, the reading group here, actually, um, because it, it, it gives a very quick, easy introduction to the Luddites that's, that's good, but then has current um, and contemporary tech examples um, for today's relevance. But like Eclipse, I mean, which as I've been narrating, uses new languages, new tools, new technologies, is still functioning. The Luddites weren't against technology to go. Um, I mean, they were largely skilled machinists um, who were interested in technology, but they were opposed to mechanization in the service of capital um, and the cultural or political deployment of technology to exploit um, or endanger or impoverish people. So like the, um, the radical tradition they come out of, like the levelers and the diggers before them, they're not so much um, backward looking as looking backward in order to find the models um, that can be recovered for new social structures. They're hoping to build a new world um, inside the cracked shell of the old. And this tension between looking forward and looking backward, um, this kind of temporal impossibility is the very definition of an avant-garde archive, right? So from the one side, the avant-garde is a, is a temporal paradox. We only know something is avant, is avant-garde, um, once it is by definition no longer avant. Otherwise, people just, people just head out in the wrong direction. They get lost. They're idiosyncratic. It's only after people follow them that they can be ahead of anything. It's only after you have the arriere guard that anyone is avant-garde. Um, and from the other side, the archives obviously look 
backwards. They're inherently conservative. Their intention is something like the experimental or the avant-garde. They're trying to conserve something of what they contain. Um, but they're also indexing a future. You're archiving for some user at some point in the future for some use uh, that you're saving all this material to begin with. Um, right? I mean, if, if the work on Eclipse had done their avant-garde job, I wouldn't need to be saving them. They still have some potential, I must believe, to do something for us today or tomorrow. And for some of these works, and we'll just end here, um, that moment may have arrived. Some of the very earliest works on Eclipse, um, writers for whom I had a, a complete oeuvre, um, have recently had their books republished, have had their first flurry of kind of scholarly or um, critical chapters and articles 40, 50 years after they were published, straight from these files on Eclipse, Norman Pritchard's two books recently published by two different uh, presses along with scholarly book chapters. Um, he was included in The Last Whitney Biennial. Um, Russell Atkins um, with an anthology of scholarly essays and uh, selected poems along, again, with brand new academic articles, the same for um, same for Peter Inman, the same for and that's Gordon Getz, but same for Bernadette Mayer, um, who's had new books republished, um, new museum shows. And in fact, the next addition to the archive is going to be the complete correspondence between Bernadette Mayer and Clark Coolidge. So that preview for you is the near future of the backward looking archive. And my point here, not self-congratulatory prescience. This is for authors out of 130. That's, someone who's doing math can tell me that's 3%. That's not a great batting average. Um, my point is said that, you know, rather than be something like an anthology, which fixes a tradition, the point of Eclipse um, has been um, to be the start of something um, and the start of future uses that I don't even want to try to imagine, um, which is built into the structure of the site and it's untagged, plain text, anti-semantic Luddite ethos. Okay, that's enough from me. Um, I hope we can have more conversation about what this could possibly mean for people doing projects today. Um, questions and objections and metadata questions. <laughs> um, well, I appreciate this talk. My first website was built with the tilde up in the URL. Um, so I was feeling very nostalgic. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on sort of there's a current trend to get into the idea of like minimal computing when it comes to digital scholarship projects. So I was wondering, do you think that since it is say the Eclipse archive has stayed the same for so long, it's actually at the forefront of that minimal computing environment? Well, only inadvertently <laughs> because of my <laughs> ignorance, but I think it'd be good, yeah, it'd be a good reason to think why would why would we want to do something that is not as fancy and flashy and Pitching ahead of the curve, mm -hmm. but rather saying, well, you know, the, the other, I, mean, I should say, the other irony here, right, is that I'm I'm archiving these these books. They're very sturdy. They're they're on paper. I don't need anything to access them except light on in the room I want to read in. On these were originally originally on zip drives. Uh, that's iOmega, which lost 95% of its market share by the middle of 2000. I transferred everything to CDs. The CDs that are, hold the original scans are already um, deteriorating. I can't access all of the image files. Even. So the idea that the idea of permanence, this looks incredibly permanent after 25 years, but 
how long the book's been around on on paper. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna outlast them. I don't know how I missed that, but um, I want to know a little bit more about what that is. Um, is that a is that a competitor? Yeah, they're big, and I don't know technically how it how it worked, but um, they had much for the same file size. You could you could zoom in at scales that were smoother okay. and deeper than you could with a DOD. It, it got used for a while with map makers. Um, so you, if you scanned a map, you could really zo zoom in and detail. Um, yeah. Um, just like a word or two, I, I am curious what sort of, and this is, I mean, obviously for you, but like what's the kind of gatekeeping about, like why, what in my opinion is kind of a finite number of texts? Um, is, this, is this process of like, it's about, the authors want to be involved? Is it about you believe there's no other way to access these texts? Is it about, you know, just what makes that selection process? Yeah, mean, you know, at the heart of it, yeah, is um, things that I want to share, um, things that, um, I mean, the origin of the project, and this goes back to 1998, um, it was a moment when, um, well, I'd moved, I'd moved from Berkeley, um, which had all these used bookstores with plenty of small press literature in them and a great library. And Princeton, I don't mean the kind of their library, they have an amazing library, but not if you want to work on contemporary experimental poetry, which they have nothing. Um, I suddenly realized that, you know, I had this kind of flag waving belief in teaching the avant-garde and teaching the contemporary and that you can't teach this if you can't give books to students. Um, and it was a time when people were starting to talk, scholars, ostensibly scholars, were starting to talk about language poetry, which they had never read. You got, you got, you got articles saying that you, they did or didn't believe in language. And I just thought, this is crazy. This is like, Imagine if I were a Renaissance scholar and I said, you know, I really don't like cavalier poetry. I've never read, I've never read done or anything, but um, I have strong feelings about it. So that we've got to make stuff available. I just want to share things. Um, so that's how it starts. And then most of it is me thinking, it'd be great if people knew about this, either because I think it's good or just because it's really weird. Like some of the stuff is good because it's so bad. Um, and I just want examples of kinds of extremity that, you know, and I think you get people um, kind of feeling that they know, you know, that something is very, is very radical or something's like a radical book work because it comes in a box. But they don't know the more extreme works that would put that into context, even if they're good at that. So it is accessibility first, and, and it, these are all, for the most part, cases where like if I couldn't get one of these texts outside of this. Library. Yeah, these were, I mean, there are exceptions to this, but these were for the most part published in editions of 150 in 1978. Um, they're either super expensive if you can find a copy, they're in special collections, which is great, but hard for lots of people to access at once. Um, or they're, 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 just un, they're just unavailable. But, and the, um, I mean, the point I want to make about the hand-typed HTML and the O'Reilly Guide is, um, you know, I don't, I, I think of Eclipse as not being a, the, the gatekeeping um, site of, of record and, um, and institution, but rather the, the model that says, go, it's not that hard, go build your own. Um, if, you don't like, if you don't like the stuff on Eclipse, like, there should be hundreds of Eclipses in which people make available the kind of books that I don't want to read, but that you really do want me to read, and that would be. Yeah. 
don't have like copyright issues when you're going through this because I think obviously the like you said it would be a comparison to like records, right? But all of those are out of copyright. So what kind of battle do you have with that? Ooh. Um. I don't know which one. I've got two. I've got two points. I don't know which one to start. It. Let me start small and say, um, essentially no. Um, I had an author who was part of the, the first books on Eclipse, who um, it's actually not it was schizophrenic. It was, it was not well. Um, so I don't, I don't want to make light of it, but. Um, wanted me to sign a contract saying that I would never archive material of his on Eclipse. Um, so I took that off. I know it's not illegal, it's not legal even, but um, about years later, his literary executor after he died called me and said, you know, th this work would make so much sense on Eclipse. It's like kind of the missing puzzle piece. Why isn't it there? <laughs> um, so we put it back on. Um, or this is also probably a case of, uh, it's kind of diagnostic problems, but that Barrett Watt wanted me to go through and, and put the little uh, the little C inside a circle, which is not even required anymore for copyright, to copyright his page design, which is that he typeset pages just like the manuscripts he'd been sent from the authors, which looked like every poem ever, quatrains with the first letter capitalized. Um, so I've had a few moments like that but essentially not because, and I think what, so the input I want to get to, maybe not Project Gutenberg, but kind of shadow libraries you get with Sean Dockery's um, ARG or Dushan Barak's Monoscope or um, Marcel Morris from Heroes, uh, Memory of the World, these pirate sites. Um, I'm, which evolved, the clips evolved in kind of direct dialogue with these, these sites and these people, kind of built in this Uber web, which I worked on at the same time, which was post first, ask questions later. Um, and so I'm often embarrassed that Eclipse is completely permissioned and 100% above board um, in terms of intellectual property, which I don't believe in. Um, but the difference between Eclipse and those sites is that the community of writers on the clips with a few exceptions are all people who might be in the same room in real life. Um, and <laughs> so angry dog um, in the same room as a dog <laughs> and Barrett Watton in real life. Um, and in which, in those cases, the, you know, suppose you're an architecture student and you're using R, you might, um, you might know a group of people you want to collaborate with, but you don't know John Baudrillard, and you don't know whoever's at MIT publishing it, and you don't know who's distributing it. But for these, well, I'm only a step away from the people who are not only writing these works, but are typesetting them, or printing them, or publishing them, or distributing them, and are reading them. And so there, I feel less inclined to disregard their concerns about it. So I'd like to. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. Yeah. <laughs> that was meandering, I know. Okay. I'm glad Haley asked the question about copyright, because I was debating between asking about that and this. But I'm curious about issues of scholarly credit. So even digital Utah, it certainly wasn't recognized 
as having taken labor as the most great editing lesson humanities to do or literary faculty would take on print journal um in my team or something like that. And of course we'd be sick because of the good journal that we've done. There's nothing to this to um, yeah, but I think this is such a really doesn't bother me. Um, but I, I think because I wouldn't, I think because I would never do it in place of something else, or I wouldn't do it. I think one, I don't know the answer. The answer is that I wouldn't write a monograph just to be familiar with it. I would write a monograph if I want to write a monograph regardless of what is going on in my life. That is true. You can do that. It's a monograph too, bro. Yeah, why? Yeah, so like I help organize the local flame scene and I run up with the mics and stuff. And uh, the tragedy of spoken word poetry is that it often dies from the culture. Uh, because there's you know not really anybody recited. They'll put out a chat book, but then you know, when I kind of die in obscurity with them. And I just have stacks of like people who have come to open mic and they've given me their book and stuff like that. So how can one submit work? The archive. I don't, I don't oh, make my own archive? Yeah. I've been doing a lot of fun to also, in a sense, I'm not devoted to making sure that I increase my viewership or sell ads or anything. I mean, in most of the books was scanned and scanned and written after going to the um, and you know one glass of whiskey and get the scanner out and you know, it's the time you could otherwise watch a television show or do something as equally cool as you can. Andy's gonna be therapeutic. I think we're, we're probably at the top of the hour. Mm -hmm. If y'all have um, appropriate, you are helping us pioneer this technology <laughs> today going. in light of the topic. And so I didn't break it home. No, oh, you showed us some things we need to fix. But I just want to take a second to thank Craig for his talk today. Uh, thank you to those of us joining us online as well. And we'll be back next time.